Hello and welcome to Nortec's webinar. Discover the latest innovations in Nortec DVLs and SIPC vehicle technology. Here is a quick overview of today's agenda. So for the introduction, we have Carsten Wirtz from Terra 4 GmbH for this presentation new to underwater navigation and Doppler velocity logs. Um, following Carson's presentation, we have Herman Hutema from Nortec DV with the presentation, what is required for precise navigation. Following Herman, um, we are jumping to innovations at Nortec and we have Rory Finlay from Nortec UK talking about extending DVL capability without impacting form factor. Torsten Pedersen from Nortec AS We'll be talking about low cost vehicle control, all in the palm of your hand. Um, we also have three guest speakers who joined us today, starting with Mikhail Latash from Now Marine with his presentation, Subsea Autonomous Cephalopod Robots to Minimize Environmental Footprints. Uh, we also have with us Edgar Hunneberg from Imer Navigation GmbH. He will be talking about the usage of inertial technologies in C applications. And our uh, final speaker is David Oven from Citronix. <clears throat> His presentation is called Valor Reaching Beyond Its Class. At the end of all the presentations, we will have a Q&A session where you can ask your questions aloud. If you have any questions throughout the presentations, Please feel free to ask them in the chat box. So, without further delay, let's start with our first presentation. Karsten, would you like to take over? Thank you much. I would like to start to give first an introduction to uh, underwater navigation and especially about Doppler velocity logs, <clears throat> DVLs, in that context. Let's first talk about what subsea navigation is. It's a question about where are we going, especially underwater, of course, where you don't have any GPS, so it's uh, more difficult. Uh, you must go, you want to go from a reference position A to B with an acceptable amount of error, and continuously you want to know your position. Subsea navigation is required in uh, different applications, for example, in industries, oil and gas, renewables, exploration, where you have mostly uh, tethered roughs uh, in operation. So there's some uh, pilot on, on the surface, but there's also demand for more and more autonomously uh, operations. This is for maintenance, inspections, surveys. Then you have military applications. This is for mine countermeasures, reconnaissance, special operations. AOEs that normally are uh, going for a longer mission, for, for longer tracks, need a higher level of accuracy and therefore must have DVLs and uh, in inertial navigation systems. And then we have diver navigation, where normally a person, a diver is with it. It's a shorter mission uh, and it needs a lower level of accuracy. We have uh, two classes of um, subsea navigation for subsea navigation. One is a class of uh, acoustic positioning. That, uh, there are two, two examples for this one. We have the long baseline. Uh, system. This is a uh, fixed network underwater on the sea bottom. Uh, it's a grid of transponders, uh, self calibrating by triangulation, and uh, the surrounded area for the underwater vehicles within the surrounded area, there's a very high accuracy of less than a meter, or sometimes a few centimeters even. So it's very accurate. However, it's expensive. Uh, it, it must be uh, installed, so high deployment requirements and also for maintenance, such as changing batteries. So this kind of um, position network of, sub of subsea navigation uh, makes sense if there's a longer project going on uh, where those costs uh, are rectified. The other uh, more flexible solution with acoustic positioning is the ultra short baseline system. So you have one reference station uh, on the surface, mostly a vessel. And this is a bearing, classic bearing principle. So there's a pinging between the surface and the underwater vehicle. It's very flexible, fixed to install. 
uh, uh, fast to install, and it's mostly for smaller ROFs. Uh, however, there are error sources for these kind uh, of uh, navigation because you must always be in line of sight with the vehicle. If there are any structures or under vehicles between the vehicle and the surface that it could cause problems, there are shadow zones. Sometimes the sounds, the sound gets refracted uh, if there are different temperatures in the water, etc. So you must accept or you must be aware that there could be a loss of communication. The other class, uh, not acoustic positioning, but the other class is then the combination of a DVL, of a velocity log, and um, different aiding sensors like rotation sensors, accelerometers. Uh, first, let's explain what a DVL is. A DVL is acoustic positioning system that uh, um, estimates the velocity over bottom. This is done by sending sound along different beams to the bottom. Should be at least three beams, but uh, Nordic has four, for example. And uh, then you, you identify the Doppler shift uh, from the different beams. All beams show in different directions, so receive different uh, shifts. And the uh, software calculates uh, the, the speed and the direction within the XYZ relative coordinate system of the DVL. Uh, must be said as well that the range depends on the sound of frequency, so of the frequency, I mean. Of, uh, if this is a DVL 1000 with 1000 kilohertz, then this is, uh, gives you a range of about 75 meters. If it's a DVL 500, it's uh, longer, up to 200 meters. The, the, the thing is that uh, the DVLs with a lower frequency normally are bigger. They have bigger transponders, are more expensive. However, we will see later today that it must not necessarily be, be that way. But in, in general, you can say this is a trade-off about uh, the range of the bottom track and uh, the costs. How does it work? You have the beam uh, and you send out a pulse along the beam. You see on the right side, A, B, C, D, different scenarios. And you see on the left side, uh, the reflected uh, uh, the pulse from, from the particles of water. With an A and B, the pulse still is in the water column going down, down to the ground and gets reflected, which you see on the left side, A and B. And as soon as it hits the bottom, there's a very strong signal which gets analyzed then in comparison to the transmitted pulse, the similarity to make sure that you reach, that you analyze the right uh, return signal. This is very loud. It must also be said that the pulse should be a long pulse uh, with a lot of energy. And um, yeah, by then, if you know then that this is the right signal which you receive, you can uh, uh, analyze the Doppler shift. In addition to uh, bottom track, it's also possible to use each of the pings for water track. Water track means measurements in relation to the water around. This happens in an adaptive uh, cell. Uh, cell size and positioning depends on the range. Uh, this is maximum uh, cell size of about 4.5 meters. But uh, the accuracy of this method is of course less in this bottom track because water always are always currents around. So it's not that fixed as a, as a sea bottom. And what can be done as well is using um, a, a DVL in addition like an ADCP. So you can record current profiles. However, in this case, you must sacrifice pings some of the pings for current profiles, it's not concurrently, like with bottom track and water track, which means that you have to, uh, to, to determine at the beginning how many pings you want to use for bottom track and how many you want to use for current profiles. A DVL alone without any aiding sensor gives you the relative change of position. This normally is not enough, uh, just could be useful in cases where you have station, station keeping, so you want to avoid, in principle, any kind of velocity. You want to stay stable over ground. In this case, uh, that could help to, to simply um, confirm that there is no speed over ground. However, more, more, more common is the use with a uh, heading sensor. There are different uh, classes of quality, accuracy. If you have a DVL with an AHRS, and this one with a magnetometer, 
For example, this is a simple dead reckoning. It navigates it to a position and helps to come home. There are low accuracy requirements, and this is mostly with cheaper or smaller vehicles that simply have to go somewhere and come back. Um, the point is that a magnetometer has an accuracy of about uh, 0 0.5 degrees, which means over a track of one kilometer is already an in, uh, inaccuracy of uh, 8.7 meters, which you see here on the right side. The blue dotted line is the, is the calculated position. Uh, the red line is a real track, and you see that there's already a difference. This is cumulative, cumulative error. So after a while, this error grows. So this is just affordable and acceptable for shorter missions. Um, if, if it becomes bigger or longer tracks, and if there's a higher demand of accuracy, you should have a DVL with an INS, which is an inertial navigation system. This is with, uh, has integrated the Kalman filter, which I explain later. Um, it's similar, but a longer duration. And you also need a better compass, so not, a not a magnetometer, but uh, you need to have uh, something like a heading sensor, which is, could be a fiber optic gyro or ring laser gyro. It doesn't depend on the Earth's magnetic field. It's uh, north seeking, not nautic seeking. <laughs> and um, it has an accurate heading. And um, the uh, velocity and attitude gets uh, calculated from the accelerometers. And within a navigation processing and Kalman filtering, you get a pretty more accurate positioning, which is represented here by the orange line. You see, if you compare those, you, the blue line was with a magnetometer. magnetometer. The uh, red, is a, red dotted is a real track. So it's already much closer to the real position. And uh, how does it work? Uh, it integrates, it needs a Kalman filter that um, helps to um, avoid or to calculate out the errors. The Kalman filter is an algorithm that fuses different data sources in order to estimate the position. So it gets, it improves it step by step by uh, having better weights for the data sources and for the estimates. And the longer it goes, the better the, uh, the calculations and the accuracy will become. And you see on the bottom graphic, the DVL with the blue circles, which those are the uh, recorded positions. And uh, this is relatively noisy. It has a lower time resolution as an uh, inertial sensor uh, in the middle. But however, uh, the uh, term accuracy is quite good along uh, and doesn't drift. It's a good long-term accuracy. While with inertial sensors, you have to integrate, time integrates that in twice from acceleration to velocity, from velocity to displacement. And there's a mathematic uh, error in it that grows. And after a while, this error is not acceptable anymore. So you need uh, an aiding sensor for inertial sensors to uh, correct that drift. And this is done by the Kalman filter and leads you to the graphing on the top, where you see then a uh, very uh, uh, track in high resolution and also without a drift. So this is then the optimum out of it. So coming then to my last slide, uh, in subsea navigation, there are different error sources. There are biases with a fixed offset, for example, a misalignment between a DVL and a heading sensor that can be uh, corrected by calibration. There are random errors. Those are errors with a zero mean uh, value in uh, comparison to the true value. So um, one way to, uh, to correct that is by statistic or by averaging out. And then there are transient errors. And transient errors are troublesome and uh, could be very, could be different and uh, very uh, many sources. However, um, as long as those accuracy, uh, the defined accuracy requirements are not below 0.05%, those stringent errors are not really important. And then there are different solutions or ways to, to solve those errors, which are calibration, statistic, a tight integration. And those will be uh, presented now by Herman, who takes over. Thank you very much. And Herman, you can take over. Yes, thank you. Just share my screen quickly.
Yes, I assume that you all can see my screen right now. Yes. So I'll start. Um, okay, uh, now we know all the types of errors Karsten's informed uh, us about, but um, how do we manage it? Well, apart from using a good set of supporting sensors, we require to calibrate the whole solution. So um, what is done during the calibration and what is the purpose of a calibration? Well. It's intended to remove the systematic errors and biases in the navigation solution. So uh, one of those is the alignment offset or lever arm between the DVL and the heading sensor. And uh, a second one is the scaling error of the DVL, which affects the measured velocity of the DVL. So what should we do to calibrate once we have connected the auxiliary systems like a, a speed of sound sensor, um, an INS uh, and a compass to the navigation solution. Well, we should run a course of several kilometers long, depending on the quality of the trusted solution. And most of the times uh, the trusted solution is an RTK GNSS for comparison. And there is a rule of thumb that um, the line should be at least 10,000 times longer than the um, aiding position standard deviation. So for instance, for an RTK GNSS, this is 10 centimeters, meaning that we should at least run uh, a line of one kilometer long, but in practice, the longer is the better. Um, after a successful calibration, we typically run uh, a validation line to, to validate uh, the outcome once again. And um, if we're um, doing a calibration, um, the hydrographic market um, aims for an error typically of 0.1% of the travel distance. So meaning that uh, after one kilometer, we will have an offset, an error of a meter. Um, yeah, types of error sources. Um, Karsten already explained static offsets, random errors with a zero mean, um, and the time varying um, errors. Um, so I will not repeat that again. Um, so static uh, offsets and random errors uh, can be calibrated for. Um, but what else should be we be, uh, aware of? Well, uh, it turns out that the DVL is actually not the largest error source in the complete navigation solution, uh, but it's more the quality of the compass, uh, which is used, and the quality of the speed of sound estimate that we use. And I have some slides over uh, about that over here. So what does a heading offset error do? Uh, well, uh, when it's a 1% or 2% error, well, what's the difference? Um, well, we can see over here that um, an error, uh, when we look in a heading offset, an error, we can see that the, the graph over here, that uh, a 0 0.4 degree offset is already responsible for um, an error of 0.1% of the total travel distance. And if we look to the speed of sound sensor, uh, we can say that, um, a 15 meters a second error on the speed of sound sensor uh, already provides an error of 1% in the total travel distance. Um, if you not choose to use the speed of sound sensor, but um, you choose to um, calculate the speed of sound based on the formula of Metwin, which is uh, possible uh, by using the temperature sensor of the DVL and the pressure sensor of the DVL and by estimating the uh, a fixed salinity in PPT. Um, we should say that uh, the temperature sensor inside of the DVL, Nordic DVL, is 0.1% uh, accurate, uh, which provides us already an error of 0.5 meters a second on the speed of sound. And if we uh, assume or um, misassume the uh, speed, uh, the salinity with two PPT. PPT, we see that it will have an error of uh, two and a half meters a second. So plus the five, uh, 0 0.5 meters a second, that will give us uh, roughly three meters a second error 
in, 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 the, in total, it will run on uh, 0.25 on the position error. So um, on the left, we see uh, the typical performance of a high-grade fiber optic gyro. And on the right, you see a summary of the magnetic compass. And uh, we can say that it's difficult to work with it um, as it's not constant and has many possible changes in behavior due to its external environment where it is. So the question is, should we always use a high-end uh, fog uh, fiber optic gyro or uh, just a magnetic compass? Well, uh, that depends on the budget and on the job itself. So a magnetic compass, um, when you use a magnetic compass, it will of course be the greatest error source of the total navigation solution. However, it could work very well in some other cases, uh, non-hydrographic uh, measurements, for instance, um, like diver navigation systems uh, or for simple debt reckoning from A to B and back to A again. Uh, so solution, which that doesn't really require survey grade navigation. So we have discussed the calibration procedure and um, the use and the influence of different grade of external devices. But um, what can Nortec do to ensure the quality of the DVL? Well, we could do um, a tank calibration in the production area in, uh, in Norway, in Oslo, where we have a, a long tank where we can tow uh, the DVL um, and, and tow a track using two beams. And then after, uh, after the track, we can uh, um, replace the DVL uh, 90 degrees and, and check the two, two other beams. And by doing this, we can get rid of the angle uh, or the error of mounting the transducers, which is typically normally mounted well below the 0 0.1 degree. Um, and this error that we find will get corrected in the DVL head file. Well, you can ask if it's required. Well, um, actually no, as the system itself requires to be field cal calibrated anyway, and this, this falls automatically inside of this field calibration. But it's a, a good overall verification during the production before it arrives at your desk. So by doing this, the unit um, itself also provides a better velocity estimate. Um, to be able to assure the performance of the DVL um, and, uh, well, Nortec does periodically a trial with the DVL with using their own vessel uh, in the Oslo Fjord. And nowadays we have uh, an all seasons vessel, uh, which is pretty comfortable in, in winter times. Um, and it's equipped with uh, a moon pool. Um, and it's a, a rigid mount uh, because of vibration and bobbling on the pole or even displacement uh, of the pole can affect the calibration performance. Um, so meaning a rigid mount for the DVL is important. And as mentioned before, an RTK antenna provides us the smallest error available for the true comparison to, so to for the um, trusted solution. And today's dual antennas also deliver uh, well, a low cost manner for uh, a good non-magnetic heading source. Um, and it doesn't have the long initialization times as a, an old standard gyro. We have a speed of sound sensor on board mounted closely to the DVL. And we have um, ethernet timing on board as well, allowing microsecond synchronization between all the into the uh, Ethernet network instrumentation. So that could be the, the um, handling sensor, the GPS, and also the DVL, which is an Ethernet instrument. Um, yeah, when we qualify, then um, the map on the right, for instance, shows a, a general calibration area, which is used in the Oslo Fjord. And it has different depths. And in this case, it's divided in 16 different tracks. Um, the long track over here on the right. And before this, the heading misalignment is uh, removed for each track. Uh, so the, each of the 14 independent tracks is, is uh, 
this is um, corrected for the heading misalignment and the right speed of sound is applied to it. Then the over or underestimation is evaluated by comparing the dead reckoning position with that of the RTK position at the end of each line. So no INS or Kalman filtering uh, with other navigation sources is uh, applied to this. So when we use this kind of data, uh, we use the um, we use and evaluate that by using uh, CEP50, which stands for circular error probable. And it's basically um, over here, let me explain it with, with, the, the, uh, with the picture over here, which is a GPS, a fixed P GPS on one position, uh, where you can see that it's accurate, but not very precise. And it uh, plots all the locations over during the two hours time frame. Um, on the the green area is the uh, twice the uh, distal distance root mean square, and uh, the red circle in the middle is the uh, CEP50, where 50% 50 of all the data is inside of this red circle. So we can see that the value that um, comes over with CEP50 is about six meters over here. Um, we did the, do the same thing with uh, our lines, and then we can plot those um, in, in another plot. In this case, it was the Compact 500, which was tested with the protective bracket over here. Um, and we could see that um, these, uh, these values fell well below 0 0.05, actually 50% of the data falls within uh, 0.032. And of course, um, yeah, we don't use that uh, on our brochure spec still uh, because we are a bit conservative and we still use 0 0.1 on the brochure for in this case. Um, then we have um, so far, uh, we have discussed what we can do physically during the production and during field tests. Um, but what can we do to supply a good set of hands to make optimal use of the data in further INS common processing? Well, we can provide the data with uh, a quality estimate. An understanding of the uncertainty is important in subsea navigation because it helps to establish uh, boundaries or confidence limits on the final estimate of the position. And um, a way to gauge the error is to use the uncertainty of the different inputs into the navigation solution in the Kalman filter to help establish the weighting and rejection of the different measurements. The result of this process is a more accurate estimate of the position and a greater confidence uh, of the estimate itself. So the estimate for a, a Nordic DVL velocity uncertainty is termed the figure of merit. And it's a unique value for each pulse transmitted from each individual beam. So it differs from the commonly used for, uh, error velocity, uh, where the error velocity is an indication that the internal measurements of the beam pairs are in dis disagreement. The form is also a measure of confidence of the velocity estimates and um, is reported in terms of a standard deviation. So it's estimated directly from the signal quality, which is also important because it means that it can be estimated independently for each single beam. Um, the form figure of merit is not only used by an INS, but it can also apply it, uh, in a simple debt reckoning navigation. So uh, to weight the individual beams, or it may be used in a basic, uh, more basic beam rejection filter. So it could be using a three beam solution instead. Um, this brings us to uh, yeah, the delivery of a useful quality information. Um, we need tight timing. 
of the data and that plays a significant role in the navigation solution. As you can see, for instance, uh, where you have dynamic motion, uh, the internal sensors, uh, yeah, they're instantaneous, um, providing low noise, um, high sample rate, but the INS internal sensors, uh, they drift in time, as Karsten already mentioned, and the DVL itself is yeah, delayed because the acoustics have a, a certain travel time. Um, it has more noise on the, on the signal, uh, a lower sample rate compared to the inertial sensors. Um, but the good thing is it ha doesn't have any drift. Um, so therefore uh, timing is uh, a pretty uh, sufficient or pretty important over here. Um, so we provide the time of each velocity estimate for each individual bing, bing and per beam. So when it's actually measured at the bottom itself, um, this is particularly interesting uh, when you don't have any um, uniform bottoms or when your, uh, your range is actually changing. Besides the um, velocity data timing, we also have the opportunities to set the clock itself from the DVL. And we can synchronize that again with the PTP protocol, enabling the microsecond synchronization between all the um, different ethernet network instruments in the network. Yes, yeah, so summarizing, um, we require uh, a correct set of instrumentation for the job, uh, matching the required navigation performance. So uh, we can have a look to the heading sensor. Do we use a magnetic one or are we going to use a ring laser or a fiber optic? You can um, use a salinity sensor to the solution or you can choose to uh, calculate it by yourself, by the formula or by yourself, by the instrument, um, by using a, the formula of Metwin, for instance. And you can choose to do a debt reckoning or you can take the next step uh, and use an INS with ex uh, accelerator sensors and Kalman filtering. Um, on the calibration, we learned that um, there are static errors and random errors that we can calibrate for. And on the DVL itself, uh, we can try to reduce the cumulative uh, errors um, by using the figure of merit, um, have a look in tight timing and tight integration and we can deliver information per beam. And that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Herman and Carsten for excellent presentations. Um, now, uh, next on our list is uh, Rory Finlay and Torsten Pedersen. They will uh, be talking about innovations at Nortec. Rory, would you like to share your screen? Thank you very much, Enrica. So, Today I'm going to be talking about how we extend capability of our DBL product line. Um, primarily, the, the main focus I'll be looking at is how we do so without impacting on the form factor of the DBL. But I'll also cover some other, I guess, uh, features and, and things that are maybe particularly relevant to different types of subsea vehicle. And we'll hear more about those vehicles um, later on with our guest speaker. I wanted to start really just with a sort of image that shows how much is going on in the subsea world. Um, and how many different platforms there are, not only that Nortec produce, but um, you know from all sort of walks of um, walks of life really um, that utilise acoustic sensors. Um, obviously, today we're focusing primarily on vehicles, so think of ROVs, AUVs, surface vehicles, maybe, um, and other sort of varied platforms. Um, really, the, the way I sort of try to look at this off, often is that a lot of these vehicles and platforms are essentially expensive amalgamations of different components of sensors. Um, the overall ambition for a lot of vehicles really is to be able to go everywhere and see everything. And, and, and underwater, there's so many different environments um, and types of environmental conditions that you can experience. that It is actually quite hard to make sure we can extend the capability of these vehicles to go to as many places as possible. So you can think we have variations in depth, we have variations in temperature, salinity, pressure, um, we have variations in terms of the, the conditions in, like uh, at the surface versus at the seabed, so lots of wave loading, tidal forces, that kind of thing. Um, and so having this ambition to send one vehicle to as many locations and do as many jobs as possible is actually quite tricky because often we need to, if we want to add new capabilities to a vehicle, we need to add new sensors that have extended capabilities. 
Um, in order to add new sensors, these often have different size and power requirements. And for someone who's building or operating a vehicle, a new sensor with a new size or power requirement often means a redesign of the vehicle, which is quite an expensive and time consuming process. Um, from the perspective of a sensor manufacturer, it's quite easy to make, to do one or two things essentially. It's quite easy to make small sensors that have limited specifications, i.e. to shrink something that exists. Um, but it's also quite easy to improve specs whilst increasing the size and power requirements of a sensor. What is quite difficult, however, is to make small sensors that have better specifications. So moving in sort of a, the right direction in terms of what we call swap C, which normally stands for size, weight, power and cost. Um, this is a term that is sort of thrown around quite a lot, but I suppose actually depends on how you interpret it, because if we consider just the form factor and the cost of, of a system, we're not really actually considering what that does to the performance of the system. So what I'm saying really is, at which point does the process of reducing swap C, size, weight, and power, and cost, do we start to have a trade-off with the actual capabilities of the sensor, i.e. do we lose out on performance? There has to be sort of a, a balance here of not being so ambitious with um, reduction in size and cost that we actually lose out and lose a lot of the capability that we're aiming for. So in the last few years, there's been a bit of a sort of evolution in subsea navigation that's shown a bit of a divergence. We have long duration uncrewed vehicles such as AUVs, large, uh, what you call XL UUVs, you know, large sort of uh, underwater surveillance platforms, essentially, uncrewed surface vessels. Um, they're all sort of part of this push of removing, part of this push to remove people from the offshore environment, so reduce a uh, number of people that are exposed to the sort of um, dirty, dangerous jobs, as it were. Um, we want to make sure that we can keep people safe on shore doing the job that they always did, but maybe not living on a, a vessel for months at a time. Um, this has a certain set of requirements uh, when it comes to navigation. A lot of these vehicles need um, to operate for very long periods of time with low tolerance for errors in the navigation. And as we've seen from Herman and Carsten's presentations, there's quite a lot of things you need to consider there. Um, these vehicles are also the ambition is to start involving them in heavy work and construction uh, intervention and things like this. So we need to make sure that there's a safety element and that sensors are reliable. Um, as such, they generally need reliable and redundant navigation sources. So ideally solutions that allow them to scale up from a first idea through to something that is operating in new environments, say deeper water, for example, more exposed uh, conditions. On the other hand, we have a proliferation of small vehicles that are hoping to do basic work more efficiently. Um, these will be deployed in large numbers, you know, costing comparatively little, um, and want to be uncomplicated as well. Key here, though, is making these platforms capable of intelligent operation and navigation. So we might say swarming AUVs, um, maybe even something like autonomous seismic nodes being deployed. Um, I want to focus on the high performance systems uh, for now, and then Torstein after we will look at what we're doing for the, the smaller um, sort of added capability and making, making navigation more available to people. So we've been working on a new generation of DVL sensors that basically serve this high performance market. Um, the ultimate aim here really is what we want to do is to keep the survey great performance that we've, we've had in the pre-existing DVL product line. Um, but to increase the range of environments in which, in which these sensors can operate. So the crucial thing here is really is to be um, improving performance, i.e. improving range and reliability, but without changing the sensor size or weight. Um, the ultimate aim here is so that people never have to redesign their vehicles, they can add capability to a pre-existing platform without actually having to change anything. Um, in sort of broad terms, what this enables vehicles to do is to say fly at greater altitudes, um, extending mission durations out into deeper waters, um, either that or having to vary altitude less, for example, which costs uh, battery power, reduces deployment load. Um, what this might look like in terms of a product is taking something like the capability of the DVR500, which historically has been the larger of the two units we make, um, taking the form factor of the DVR1000, which was the um, smallest DVL available when it came out, um, and then pushing these two together to keep the form factor and the capability of the 500 to give us the 500 compact. So the result here essentially is to go from a maximum bottom tracking range of 75 meters 
up to 175 meters without changing any size or any form of requirement really. Um, this started off as a product mainly for inspection class ROVs. However, it's quite rapidly um, become apparent that this can be used in a, a number of different applications. So work class ROVs have started adapt adopting this too. Um, and we're now looking into um, AUVs using this a lot more frequently, simply because there's no need to redesign the hull or the, the, the pressure housing that you, um, you have for your vehicle um, to increase your range. So geographically, this takes us from roughly sort of North Sea depths, you know, about 75, 50, 75 meters to the majority of the continental shelf. And in terms of what that means for operations, being able to have bottom track from the moment you launch a vehicle to the moment it arrives at a work site is a significant benefit essentially because you always have high quality navigation aiding. You don't have to wait until you're in range of the bottom to then get a good lock and then have um, high quality navigation. You do that from the moment you deploy to the moment you approach the work site. Now at this point, I'll admit I ran out of nice looking um, custom made pictures. So you can have to deal with my uh, lack of artistic skill here to present the next one, um, which is the DVL 333. So this takes the form factor of the DVL 500, and we've uh, redesigned the transducers in this to bring the frequency of this down to 333 kilohertz. So this has increased the, the bottom tracking range from 200 meters to about 375, depending on the, um, the seabed conditions. Um, this is targeted more towards our AUVs and USVs. So vehicles that need um, high altitude operations over large variations in depth, um, and also um, from uncooled surface vehicles, which are always going to be transiting from the surface. Um, so need um, good bottom lock, essentially in a variety of conditions. The larger we can make this bottom tracking range, essentially the better. And once again, we don't want to go adding size to these sensors. We want to keep them as small as possible. So the DVL 500 is about the size of a small dinner plate. You know, if we wanted to, um, if we weren't focusing on keeping the center small, we might have to start using something like individual transducer um, plates, which can increase the size of the sensor quite significantly. Um, this is, you know, for USVs, this is much about keeping bottom track um, in as many locations as possible, mainly in the event of something like a GPS dropout, where suddenly uh, the main navigation source is lost. For AUVs, it means that you can essentially fly at greater altitudes, um, and you also have less reliance on alternative methods of um, uh, velocity correction, such as water track. So now I'm just going to go through a few um, sort of cases from mainly from the UK, but around the world where we've used essentially mainly just the 500 compact um, on such a, a sort of a large range of applications and vehicles. Once again, my, uh, my artistic skills are lacking here, but I'll try to hopefully illustrate the point reasonably well. So the first example we're using is we used a 500 compact DVL on an amphibious survey vehicle, which is essentially being used to uh, survey across estuaries to give laser scanning um, above the water, multi-beam scanning beneath the water, current profiling, and also uh, GPS uh, dependent, uh, sort of redundant navigation. So what we're doing here is using a DBL to simultaneously measure the currents and track the seabed to input a velocity reading through an inertial navigation system. This started off as quite a large vehicle in the first phase as it's part of a, a MOD competition. Um, and just last week, we were using the second phase of this, which is to install it on a much smaller vehicle alongside a multi-beam where we're um, alternately triggering uh, the uh, DBL and multi-beam to make sure we're getting current profiles and bottom tracking alongside the multi-beam symmetry measurement. The same sensor has also been used in diver navigation systems. So this uh, here priority is essentially the size of, of the system and the maximum range you can get. So, what this company does is integrate the DVL head into this underwater uh, module that's used by divers. And this gives us dead reckoning um, for essentially for special forces who need to navigate underwater without surfacing for any GPS lock. After this, we look at USVs where we've used uh, this on one of the sea kit vehicles um, along with an INS to give GPS denied navigation around wind turbines. Uh, this was also demonstrated to a number of defense clients who saw this as a, as a benefit when we're looking at essentially military uh, military based GPS jamming. This is also used to do current profiling and here we use one of the lower frequency systems because this gave us that extra little bit of range from the surface to make sure that the vessel could transit in and out of deeper waters without any uh, lots of bottom line. 
the next stage we're now seeing is to see ROVs deployed from uncrewed surface vehicles. So it would be quite helpful actually to have uh, a DVL that is able to provide the same characteristics from the deployment vehicle and from the vehicle that is being deployed. Um, at the moment, we're just looking at relatively small ROVs being deployed, but as we look towards deeper waters, once again, we want to be able to have bottom lock from the moment the ROV is deployed down to when it approaches its work site. Uh, a lot of pipeline, cable surveys, that kind of thing that's being done by these smaller vehicles are very, very near bed. And historically, DVLs have struggled near bed, especially if they're the lower frequency DVLs because you have a minimum uh, range, often referred to as the, black, as the blanking distance, um, but also the minimum amount of time it takes to emit the bottom track pulse. The nearer the bed we get, the harder it can sometimes be to determine uh, distance and also to reliably estimate velocity. What we've done recently is we're changing the way that the, the pulse is processed, essentially, that allows us to adaptively approach boundaries and get very, very close to them with, with no loss in not standard deviation, essentially, of the velocity estimates. So what is important here is we're looking at, say, operating 150 meters water. We deploy our ROV with bottom lock. It approaches the seabed to, say, less than a meter. Um, and adapts how it's processing the pulse and allows us to have much better near bed navigation. This feeds into hybrid AUV ROVs, uh, which a lot of them are aiming to be what you call resident ROVs, where they're living or docking in a garage underwater, say wind farms, and staying there for months to years at a time. A lot of these, as they're working, come along the seabed, and when they go to dock into their garage, they have to come up and suddenly go very close to a boundary. A lot of these garages are also made out of sort of metal grills, which can be really tricky for DVLs. So what we've been working on here is making using this adaptive algorithm essentially to allow us to go from a normal bottom tracking range to suddenly a very short bottom tracking range into the docking garage at low speeds. Um, and then they can connect there, recharge their batteries, transmit data, that kind of thing. Likewise, though, these hybrid AUVs need to operate at higher altitude. So there's a lot of transition here between near bed operations and higher up. So we need to make sure that we've got that minimum and maximum range really covered. One of the, weirdly enough, more traditional um, applications we've been doing here with the lower frequency systems is uh, typical AUV operations. So this is the L3 Harris uh, either AUV, um, which has a 500 kilohertz system on it as well. At this point, this is about a mixture of form factor and maximum range as well. So being able to fit into these very quite narrow spaces but also to be able to give a good high altitude uh, bottom track that's able to aid their long-term navigation because these need a very, very high accuracy uh, navigation overall. And finally, uh, one of the more recent ones we've been doing is adapting the, uh, slightly adapting the design of the 500 compact to be compatible with shilling ROVs. A lot of these do very, very uh, heavy duty work that's also quite safety conscious. So for example, we have uh, using manipulators to physically turn valves and to, to pick things up and, and, and that kind of thing. Um, these often happen quite near the bed and the pilot doesn't really want to have to be doing their own station keeping whilst trying to use manipulators. So having a DVL that feeds in very accurate and reliable bottom track messages is able to automate our sort of automatic altitude holding and also our station keeping and allow the pilot to focus on doing the task at hand. Um, this is an adaptation we've made over the last year or so just to be able to be compatible with these specific ROVs, but this sort of really applies to most world-class ROVs as well. Obviously, it's quite nice to have a reliable DVL that has an excellent maximum and minimum range. However, there are secondary functions that are quite important to consider here, really. Um, I, I guess the, the sort of the main point is that adding functions to something like a DVL means that you can do the task of multiple different sensor packages on board. Let's say, for example, altimeters um, and other pressure sensors, we can replace those with one DVL. Um, and this frees up space for other sensors, other purposes, ultimately making a vehicle um, capable of doing more tasks. There's a few functions of note, I suppose, that are worth bringing people's attention to. The first of these is pressure and temperature. We've already talked about temperature sensor on board. Pressure will give us an idea of how far we are beneath the sea surface surface, so that tells us how, how deep we are. In addition to this, we're able to output altitude. Um, altitude is quite a simple calculation for DVLs. If we know the travel time of our acoustic pulse, we essentially divide that by two, and that gives us our distance, much like it would with a parking sensor. Um, one thing to be aware of when it comes to this kind of function is that reliability of the bottom track is even more important here. So if you're in your policy in ROV that is approaching the seabed, and we're getting altitude reading from our DVL. 
it's going to suddenly probably most software uh, sort of operations on ROVs will have a, a minimum safe altitude that the ROV is able to maintain before it gives a, a warning saying it's about to hit something. Um, that's fine getting that from the DVL. However, if you don't have reliable bottom track, what can happen is say if there's dredging operations nearby or if the thrusters of the ROV are kicking up clouds of sediment, some DVLs, if not reliable enough, will give a false detect where it detects the cloud of sediment, for example, and thinks that's the seabed. So it will then start giving warnings saying you're about to crash when in fact actually you're quite far from the seabed. So using the bottom track algorithm, we have to do a lot of work to avoid false detects. We're able to know where exactly where the seabed is at all times. I use the sort of analogy of thinking that if you're parking your car, there's always some cars will have a really oversensitive parking sensor that tell you're about to hit something when you know full well that you're quite a long way away. So in lots of safety sensitive operations, this is really important, having a reliable um, value for altitude rather than just um, something that's a bit spurious and can change based on the local condition. The last point I wanted to make is current profiling. This is something that Carsten said, we can alternate the pings between our um, bottom tracking and current profiling. This is maybe a function that is not utilized quite as much as it could be in uh, ROV operations, particularly in near bed operations. Um, so what we see essentially is near the seabed is where we see most of our velocity change. And this is what you call the logarithmic velocity profile. So essentially we have shear, which is change in velocity over, over depth. Um, and most of the velocity change tends to happen near the bed. Unfortunately, lots of ROV operations also happen very near the bed. So here we see just an example plot of just the shear change here, going from velocities of about 70 centimeters per second down to almost zero at the bed. So that sudden change there can cause quite a lot of damage to small vehicles, but also to larger ones. So what we want to be able to do is to be able to monitor these currents from range as we approach a work site. Likewise, when we deploy, if we have strong tidal currents, we want to know when we need to recover the ROV. So this could be done in two ways. You could either stream the raw current profiles through the DBL and to the operator on board. So you can stream the current profiles and the bottom track messages, which can give you your residual currents. But also recently, the Nautic DBL has been added as a driver to Quincy survey software. So this allows us to stream uh, corrected current profiles using the onboard heading sensor in real time. And this just provides a very basic plot, you know, probably not for scientific purposes, but just for operational purposes. This could be really helpful to know when you're approaching an area that's got dangerously high currents or when the currents are dropping off enough for you to deploy and recover. So ultimately, the idea here is that we can save time and money and not waste deployment time um, when operating offshore. So that's all from me. I'll now hand over to Torstein to talk about how we service the cheaper vehicle market. Thank you, Rory. Uh, well, let me to just share my screen. So, uh, as I said, I'm picking up where uh, Rory left off, and I'll be talking about how we get these sensors aboard uh, smaller vehicles. So, I was described earlier is that Nortec, Nortec makes a standard product portfolio that uh, addresses the needs of survey grade uh, applications. So, these are often found on these work class vehicles, and um, what it usually means is, is that it gets paired together with an INS because what an INS of a high grade and what this is done because we need a high quality INS to match a high quality DBL. So that means that this equipment, because of size, means it's usually found on large vehicles with big budgets um, that can handle the greater weights or demanding um, equipment for tougher, tougher environments. And they generally have a higher position accuracy requirement. But that's not the entire world that we're seeing that's growing out there. Um, we know that there is a, a new subsea community that's uh, growing and it's grown quite rapidly. It's been around for several years now, <clears throat> um, but the numbers are really starting to grow. And what we're really seeing is that this, this quotient of, of capability to its price is really changing. And it means that uh, it's becoming attractive to a lot of end users because it can fulfill more and more of their needs. And this is in complete contrast of what we've been seeing with the other ones uh, in the world, where you know these are small, low budget, they're light, they go to shallow waters, they're low accuracy, uh, and they need to be used by everyday people and everyday applications. So, we see up here in the upper right hand corner is the Nortec uh, DVL 1000 uh, and it's integrated and 
while it can be in, integrated onto one of these very small vehicles, you can see that it, it's not really well suited because you need this, this extension skid below it. Uh, it so it protrudes down quite a bit. Um, it's not exactly elegant. And most importantly, you have now a DBL that exceeds the price of the vehicle. So what is really needed is, um, is something that's smaller that can help these guys out. You know, it doesn't have to necessarily have to have the accuracy, but it needs to be a more complete solution and size adjusted to them. So what are these small uh, vehicle operators for? Well, I think it, you could fair to say is that they want to have something that is in their price class that they can handle that doesn't exceed the, value, the cost of the, of the vehicle itself. It has to be small so it can fit on the vehicle. And it basically has to have just enough to address the specifications of the altitude over the bottom, you know, the depth that it can travel at, and the velocities that it will be traveling at to fulfill their needs. So there's really two areas I see it is that um, that they're really what these people need. The first is a vehicle control. So with vehicle control, we're talking about station keeping. We're talking about operating at a constant. Uh, distance over the bottom or a constant depth. Uh, maybe they want to pitch the nose down and look at something with their cameras and hold that position. So this is a vehicle control. These are things that are difficult to do for inexperienced users. The second thing is the navigation, which is what we've been talking about. So the position and navigation doesn't necessarily have to be survey grade, but what it has have to do is it has to allow the, end, the pilot of the vehicle get to where they want to be and know where they are when they get there. So what this really is they're saying was we're enabling the average person to use these people, these vehicles. So, you know, these work class vehicles, you go through quite a bit of training to operate these vehicles. What we're seeing now is with these smaller ones is that anybody can put it in the water and start using them, but to use them efficiently and effectively and high current value areas or complicated terrains is, is still going to be challenging. So they need tools that can help them uh, along the way where they don't necessarily need training. So we can imagine in the future is that many facilities along the coast and on vessels in the future will have one of these on board and any one of the crew members, facility operators has to have the ability to pick one up and start using it to go do an inspection, let's say. So what is the integration process for these? So the vehicle manufacturers most likely be the ones that are doing the integration and deliver, delivering their vehicle with these solutions. So they have to deliver, they have to integrate in many different sensors if they want to have this type of control and this type of navigation. So it would be sensors such as a DVL, an altimeter, an AHRS, pressure sensors, uh, and temperature sensors. Temperature sensors are important if we're going to estimate the, the speed of sound so we get accurate uh, velocity estimates. So just add that in on the side. This also means that they have to handle individual communications for each one of these sensors. Each one of the sensors has its you know power uh, requirements and has to have power supplies to them. There has to be time synchronization of the different data streams and the data rates. Uh, and then there has to be alignment between the sensor, particularly between the DBL and the AHRS. So this is a lot of work for an integration process if they want to achieve these goals that I showed on the, the previous slide. So what is Nortec contributing uh, to this solution? So um, this goes back a little bit in history. We began with miniaturizing our, um, our acoustic sensors back in 2018 when we launched the Echo, which is a small current profiler. And here you see a picture of it in the hand of somebody. And it is, you know, it's a wireless unit with internal batteries, but the hardware was the same of where we were going with what we intended on a DBL. So it, it did, we basically established the acoustic functionality back in this time. And um, it allowed us to port over a lot of our, all our DBL code and altimeter code to this hardware platform. So I think the question that, that comes up is like, well, how small can it be made? Um, and this really comes down to the transducer sizes. So the transducer sizes is really what governs how small the sensor can be. Because as the transducers become smaller and smaller for a given frequency, 
this angle that I'm showing you here from the transducer starts to open up larger and larger. And it becomes clear that as this opening angle becomes larger, your accuracy in your navigation will go down more and more. So we see this from our, for instance, with our, um, our uh, DBL 500s. We went down to a uh, the smaller transducer on the compacts. There was a slight uh, change in um, in the accuracy of that, and we know that if we didn't, for instance, went down even to smaller to this, it would get even uh, lower grade accuracy. So there's a sort of a trade off that we have to look at when we when we look at the size of these. So we ended up with this, uh, what we call the Fusion DBL 1000. And it's a complete sensor platform with a suite of sensors necessary for the control and navigation. As I said earlier, it has the common Nortec DBL firmware. So we were able to just port over the DBL firmware and had that up and running first on this unit, which is considered probably the most challenging aspect of this. Uh, it has single comms, uh, single power supply and it is pre-calibrated and aligned. You probably saw it in an earlier slide uh, shown that we actually have a calibration facility. So when this sensor uh, marches up and down this tank with its DVL running and collecting AHRS data, we do the, the alignment uh, in the calibration stage of the sensor platform, which is again, a benefit when um, a system integrator, once they have an AHRS installed in their vehicle and a DVL, they have to take the whole vehicle out in the field and then they have to do the uh, calibration and alignment process, which is time consuming uh, and expensive. So this is what the sensor looks like and these are what it's composed of. So we have three beams that are dedicated. These two, three transducers off at an angle are dedicated for the DBL. Uh, it comes in two different accuracy levels, uh, one that's license free at 1% accuracy, and then there is the 0.3% long-term accuracy as well for the higher grade applications. Temperature sensor here, which helps in estimating speed of sound together with the user entered uh, salinity estimate. We have water track that follows along with every uh, bottom track ping. We have an out dedicated altimeter in the center, which means that it has uh, a more accurate estimate of what the altimeter is than what you would get for the range estimates on the DBL. And it's also vertically oriented directly below the vehicle. As a pressure sensor, uh, and internally it has a magnetometer IMU, uh, which is combined to provide uh, an AHRS uh, attitude heading reference system. These uh, DBL transducers also may be used for a current profiling, which can happen in alternating pings. And the weight altogether in water is just under 300 grams. So I'm going to give a very brief glimpse at some data. It's not very uh, sexy or maybe not terribly informative, but it, what it does show you is that we have been out in the field and we've been testing this um, from the vessel that we showed you earlier. So the top plot is uh, altimeter, and I can appreciate that you can't read the axis that well, but the horizontal axis is time. And the vertical axis here on this side, uh, let me see if I get a, oops, go back one, put a pointer up. So on this axis here, we have uh, altitude over the bottom, and this value here is 40, let's see, 30, 40, so it's about a 50 roughly when it starts to pick up the bottom on the altimeter. And the DBL beam range here is similar, so each one is in increments of 10, and this is about 60 where it picks up the bottom. Again, this is a one megahertz uh, DBL. So this is a distance as we march in from deeper waters to uh, shallower waters. Uh, and then you have the three beam velocities where you have one beam pointing forward and two beams pointing aft, which is gives you the positive and negative velocities. Next we have is the uh, AHRS from lab data. Uh, what we're showing you here is um, a simulation where a um, one of these sensors is placed on uh, one of these robotic, robotic arms, which has been programmed with um, uh, data collected from a surface buoy. 
uh, with both with the AHRS data from a surface buoy. So it gives um, heading, pitch, and roll. And you can see that here uh, from the robot, what it's been programmed with in the first uh, upper right-hand side. And then it's the output here. Um, and then you can see what the difference is on this slide between the pitch and roll uh, from the robot uh, was programmed and operating with as to what was measured out. And it, the difference is very small for the pitch and roll, as you can see, and that's what's shown directly below here. Um, in a similar manner, we have the heading and you have the heading from the robot or heading from the measured. And the difference here uh, that you see is from the influences inside the building where the robots are operating from. So there's obviously some um, magnetic uh, fields created by some iron in, within the building and the operation. And the difference is showed here. I apologize that I can't uh, zoom in here and show you that exactly, but you can see it from this slide to the, this uh, plot to the, to the left. I think the good news is that you can see that they're well uh, synced together in behaviors. So that was a, a brief view of the, what's coming out uh, now from us with this DVL, the Fusion DVL 1000. Uh, what we anticipate is that production will uh, begin and deliveries will start happening in June of this year. We do have a handful of units that we're uh, testing aggressively now. Uh, we also hope to follow through this year with, an, with a navigation. Uh, so we give out position estimates as it is marching along. And we're also looking into the possibility of making uh, an OEM version of the same unit. So it's more flush mountable or integrated into your uh, vehicle itself. So I will leave it at that and turn it back over to Enrique. Thank you, Tarsen, and thank you, Rory, for your presentations. Um, next on our agenda, we have our first uh, guest speaker. It's uh, Michael Latouch, uh, Chief Engineer and CEO at NOAA Marine. And uh, he will be talking about subsea um, autonomous uh, cephalopath robot to minimize environment footprints. Michael, would you like to share your presentation? Uh, um, yes, hello again, everyone. Um, I'm sharing my presentation uh, during which I will switch off my video because I um, don't know why, but I have uh, uh, network that is really unstable. I don't know why, so I limit my video transmission, hoping that you guys see the presentation more clearly. Okay, so um, uh, thanks for uh, inviting me here. I'm uh, really happy to share a, a really brief presentation on what uh, our team is doing. Um, I just have 15 minutes, so I my plan is to go briefly through it to explain what is our objective and what we are building. And then uh, during the presentation, I will elaborate on uh, why we are here at the Nortec Day and what hardware uh, we are planning to use. Um, so far, our experience uh, with uh, Nortec uh, was excellent. And that's uh, one of the reasons why, besides the performance of the hardware, uh, this is one of the reasons why uh, we continue to uh, tighten our cooperation and uh, uh, look into the future in the Nortec developments and integrate them uh, in our Sentinel vehicles. Um, so NOAA Marine team is uh, improving the technology consisting of autonomous swarm of uh, highly efficient unmanned underwater vehicles, which left in a given area will perform months of autonomous operation and supervision without any human in intervention. This is our main objective. Uh, so basically what we are doing is we are introducing a permanent uh, sea and ocean observation networks that will deliver better quality data uh, at the same time uh, reducing costs at the client side and we are purely robotics as a service model so we don't plan to sell hardware we sell purely service of data collection. Um, our aim is to empower uh, our partners for example as a service companies to gather data for their and clients faster while enabling a sustainable use and conservation of our planet's resources for uh, sectors such as uh, wind energy, mainly uh, oil, gas, uh, also sea and ocean aquaculture, science and environment, and uh, a supervision of sea and ocean mining processes, which will uh, most likely 
in the close future will require permanent observation networks in order to uh, continue with the regulations that we'll need to meet. Uh, vehicle groups uh, combined with uh, green energy charging stations uh, left in a given area will perform months of autonomous operation and supervision without human intervention on site. This is our goal. Uh, we have uh, developed a scalable business model with a high share of recurring revenues over time and business expansion strategy strictly as business to business and business to government subcontracting model, which is a really important factor in terms of our business drive and, and goals. So at the end, uh, our aim is to provide clients with better quality data at lower OPEX costs um, much faster than that is uh, being done um, today. Um, okay, so um, just briefly uh, explaining that full implementation of our Sentinel service involves two stages. Stage one is already completed. Uh, first stage has enabled our team to complete Mm, our works on full-scale seagoing vehicles able to handle unmanned missions and carry first market pylons in the ba Baltic Sea environment. Our bionic wave drive provides the vehicles with exceptional payload capacity, maneuver maneuverability, quiet operation and energy effi efficiency, which is really important because it enables us to reach our, recharge our future fleet solely with CO2 free hybrid renewable power that will come from wave, wind, and solar energy only. And uh, stage two, uh, at stage two, right now we are uh, working on our innovative docking stations, uh, which thanks to which our uh, vehicles would, will be able to work autonomously in the sea without any human intervention with an objective to, uh, to do so up to six months without any supervision of humans and ships on site. Uh, right after the vehicles will be automatically moored to the docking station, it will send collected data, uh, chemical, geological, seismic, acoustic, visual, depending on certain sensor setup, of course, directly to the client's desk, at the same time filling its batteries with energy generated only from renewable source of energy. Mm. Well, there is obviously a lot of problems that are in the offshore industry in terms of surveying of course you can speak hours about them but uh, generally speaking our perspective as NOAA marine is that crude vessels are the main source of problem because of the cost they generate and because the the number of total number of ships that are available on the sea and will be available on the sea in the next 10 15 years will be simply not enough to service the industry and to service the uh, goals that especially are um, targeted with the energy industry. Um, naming the net zero directive uh, obliges service companies operating with ships to reduce the greenhouse gas emissions by a factor of 50% over the next decade and of reducing greenhouse gas emissions by 90% by 2040, which is very ambitious goal, but surely the industry is following that goal. Offshore operations and maintenance activities are obviously expensive because of the mainly because of the ships, as, as I uh, um, highlighted at the very beginning. Uh, the price of hiring a ship is a dominant cost of each sea operation and can reach up. This is from our experience, at least. Uh, it reaches up to 60% of each uh, mission budget that we conduct on the sea. Um, so 60% of the whole budget of all the total costs goes to the ship. Um, and this is the thing we want to change with our uh, Sentinel systems. Um, so uh, basically also what is, what is uh, very important with ships that the practice is that uh, operators that own ships only operate them to circa 150 days per year because the ships are waiting for the suitable weather conditions to, to conduct surveying, uh, surveying and service work, which also generates a lot of costs and um, brings the opportunity for um, companies that um, reduce ship usage to extend the capability to perform survey works for longer periods. So our, our goal is to have this opportunity to 
um, work with the autonomous station up to 300 days per year, uh, with disregarding the weather conditions that we have on the field. Um, what I was uh, saying then that the main objective for us is to um, reduce the operational costs, uh, which are related to ocean surveying. We do that by eliminating, or let's say at least severely minimizing the usage of crewed vessels at the area of operation. We use permanent observation networks and we plan to implement uh, permanent observation networks in order to collect data and send them directly um, from the station to the client's desk. Um, of course, 24 seven operations um, and um, mainly aimed to um, utilize renewable sources of energy um, to minimize the carbon footprint of the whole process. What is very unique uh, about our vehicles, I hope, I hope that the network is working so you guys more or less see what, what, what I'm presenting right now, but um, the, the, uh, the, the most unique feature of our vehicles is the way they um, generate propulsion force. Uh, ro uh, we have a robust patented um, bionic NOAA drive that ensures high efficiency, power and man maneuverability uh, with up to one week between charging events. We have already uh, tested the, the vehicles to be capable to contain energy for one week of operation. Of course, the wave drive uh, used on our Sentinels is not the only techno wave technology that is present on the market. Um, however, as, uh, as far as we, as we test, we have been able to build up uh, uh, a high level of endurance into the system and a robustness that let us uh, that lets us to implement it implement it in the industry, aiming for long time missions without any failures or need to uh, service vehicles in between. Of course, uh, the, the the drive enables us uh, with the silent work that the systems do not stress aquatic animals. Vehicles do not get entangled in plants on all, or other aquatic obstacles because they don't use rotational elements, which is really important, for example, in aquaculture business. We utilize only green energy, zero emission, zero carbon footprint uh, charging protocols. Um, what is also unique about our vehicles that the vehicle you see now is 2.2 2 meters in length and its payload capacity uh, it reaches even up to 100 kilograms. And the wave drive where we are using enables the vehicle to maneuver very efficiently and then very energy efficiently with, with the maximum payload, enabling it to work on a very safe manner um, on the sites that, uh, for example, contain ocean and sea uh, seabed infrastructure. So the second, um, so this is what we are testing right now. We already, uh, last year we had already full-time four sea missions in the Baltic Sea. And right now we are working on our docking stations, um, which will provide um, a simple and um, reliable solution for docking process. We have uh, uh, at, in 2023, in late 2023, uh, our roadmap is to test a fully scalable uh, solution, which will charge our vehicles solely with uh, uh, renewable sources of energy. Um, uh, the station and our system is designed to be easily scaled because scaling is one of the uh, our main driving forces behind the system we are implementing. So, and also we are offering this uh, as a service based subscription model. So there's no training required at the client side, no infrastructure required to put the floaters into the sea. Um, um, we, we operate at single mooring point from 30 meters to 3,000 3, meters in depth. So far we tested our vehicles, by the way, um, on the, let's say Baltic level um, depths. So we, don't, we do not operate at the moment at, uh, at the 3,000 meter depths. We operate at the Baltic Sea. And what is very unique uh, uh, with our docking station and what we want to do is that we want to achieve a uh, really simple and reliable docking process that does not require any seabed infrastructure on, in the system. 
So the whole docking process um, is designed to take place directly under the floaters. The floaters will contain, of course, uh, uh, wind, uh, uh, wave, and solar power um, sources in, in order to be able to accumulate power for drones. Each station will charge up to five vehicles. So far, we are testing and prototyping, and we are pretty confident that we, uh, we are on the path to achieve the goal of direct docking under the station. Uh, we call them, by the way, NOAA Synapse. So it's a, it's a special design that will enable us to perform a dynamic maneuver of docking, um, even after rough seas. Sea state six is our aim that until sea state six, the whole system should be able to operate and collect data up to three, 300 days a year. We plan to use uh, two products from Nortec product line, uh, ADCP uh, directly mounted on the floater and uh, Fusion 1000. We are hoping to be able to test it very soon, as soon as uh, Nortec will release uh, uh, testing protocols for the devices. Um, one of the key elements during our docking process is, we, is something we call predict, predictive maneuvering. So um, the whole process, without going into too much details, of course, the whole process will be a dynamic process, fairly simple dynamic process that will require, um, that will take into account that the uh, docking station and the vehicle is in the constant move in relation to each other. That's why, um, Nortec devices will help us also to check for velocities and water current movements under the floater and around the vehicle to fine tune our maneuvers and we and perform predictive um, decisions in order to correct course and correct maneuver uh, that will um, that will make our maneuver even more secure and even more uh, reliable. Of course, we, uh, we plan to use uh, standard functions of uh, DVLs, uh, like the bottom tracking, constant, uh, cost constant distance to the bottom. Um, but uh, but uh, the key component we plan to test, uh, that is uh, current measuring and incorporate current measuring uh, into predictive maneuvers during the docking process. Um, all in all, uh, we have, uh, just to elaborate one slide uh, uh, on the our business model. Uh, this is very important for us because uh, people come to us and, and ask us about the pricing of our vehicles. And we constantly repeat, we don't sell vehicles. We build the fleet to our own extent. And we build the fleet to the extent of our partnering companies on a different seas in the close future. Um, we offer the service purely as a robotics as a service model. So um, that is why we are bypassing all the all the costs on the client side, and we we are really flexible on um, um, accommodate the ship uh, functionalities or vessel functional functionalities uh, to a mission specific specific demands. Um, so this is something that is really important for us, and we want to underline. Um, just for the end, I'll just give you a, a, a three short examples of the, of the usage of our technology, just, just an, as an example from the last year missions. A wide, a wide range of applications are offered to uh, aquaculture, offshore oil and gas industry for subsea developments and uh, associ associated sea to shore infrastructure using uh, our resident autonomous sea sentinel data collector service. Um, Thanks to its unique features, the complete system uh, is, for example, designed for uh, sonar scanning throughout the investment area, water and solid sampling at the designated stations, a video inspection of habitats on cable and foundation routes. On the video, you can see a Sentinel vehicle slowly approaching uh, a weapon from the Second World War, which is a ferromagnetic object, obviously. And what is uh, important that you can see that the weight of the vehicle is 350 kilograms. Uh, with a full payload uh, operating very close to the bottom without any, uh, without the slightest disturbance of the environment in terms of water, plumes, bottom plumes, etc. So it's really safe to go on the close proximity. A second show on movie um, is another example of a direct close proximity approach to a wreck structure at the Bay of Dansk. 
um, we can we are able to conduct with detailed bathymetry throughout the investment areas, pipeline integrity monitoring, preliminary search of objects with a magnetic signature, obviously. That, ex that includes UXO mapping on cable pumping routes and, and mast places that are planned on the investment plan. And, um, uh, and also what is important that we are able to offer underwater infrastructure and ecosystem permanent monitoring with the cost efficient resident uh, service uh, using our vehicles. Um, the last uh, slide of my presentation is uh, video footage uh, that is taken directly from uh, one of the sentinels in action on the Baltic Sea. This is the one of the of the areas that are right now under the environmental assessment uh, to contain big uh, wind farms uh, at the at the Baltic Sea. So we've been able to work for one of our one of major energy providers uh, in Europe um, uh, to um, perform a data assessment, uh, including video analysis. Uh, artificial intelligence, uh, um, habitat mapping, and also uh, 3D mapping for uh, specific habitats uh, to be included in the reports. Um, we do that because we already, uh, we're already conducting missions with our vehicles. And right now we are on the way to test our docking stations in next year and uh, hopefully test uh, Nortec equipment uh, as soon as it is available for testing. So um, uh, thank you for, uh, uh, listening to my presentation and um, I'm open to uh, any questions in the Q&A session. Thank you very much. Thank you, Michael. Um, very interesting technology. Uh, now, um, Edgar Hinneber, CEO and owner of IMAR Navigation GmbH, will be exploring the usage of uh, internal technologies in subsea applications. Yes, hello to everybody. Thank you for the invitation. Uh, to hold a short presentation here about the integration between inertial technologies and um, DBLs and other sensors for subsea applications. Um, we have a very short agenda here. We give a very short introduction to IMAR, then examples of applications, position error behavior of unaided and aided uh, INS, sensor data fusion and sensor selection hints, and uh, at the end, questions and answers. Just a short information about IMA. IMA is located in Germany, southwest of Frankfurt. We are manufacturing navigation systems for all kinds of applications. We have in-house development, manufacturing, and so on uh, for all areas of inertial navigation. And this for 30 years. So. Um, we have uh, typically started with underwater vehicles, but now we are also in space and shipborne applications, tracking systems, and so on. Uh, I don't want to go too deep into that one. To do all this, um, we have testing equipment. You have to calibrate the sensors. Uh, we have heard in the other presentations, uh, calibration is an important thing for also for the inertial navigation system. So under motion, under temperature and so on, we can test our vibration in house um, and so on, also on motion uh, acquired from applications. Um, we have also an own EMI, EMC lab, which is uh, more and more important um, also for defense applications. And all this together allows us to make this uh, combined systems inertial plus something, in this case, the DBL. Uh, here you see some applications for C, sub C, and um, uh, other um, applications where we have stabilized boats and so on. I don't want to go too deep into that one. You need some inertial navigation system. This is our core business, of course, from the very, very small device, uh, only 50 grams up to big systems, depending on the technology, uh, laser gyros, fiber optical gyros, MEMS gyros, and so on. So now let us look to the position error characteristics of subsea vehicles. We have uh, heard in the um, earlier presentations that there is an impact of uh, errors. And I want to show you a little bit more in detail how to select systems and how to make your system design in combination to achieve 
certain performance. This is only just a look into a customized um, realization where you have the ring laser gyro, the electronics, the uh, interface to the DVL. And of course, um, as seen in the other presentations, you have some combination and some uh, vehicle to aid the um, inertial measurement system with the DVL. And this we are going to look uh, more in detail. This is for an ROUV um, application, but at the end, the same uh, thing. Um, looking to the very simple application, uh, torpedo navigation. Torpedo navigation uh, is like an AOV, but um, with certain requirements. And um, the advantage is that we have very good reference data for that one. And therefore, I have taken this as an example. Um, if we want to navigate, we can do it in free inertial navigation. So we can use our accelerometers and our gyroscopes. And as heard before, if you integrate the acceleration uh, twice in time, then the position error increases dramatically. Every sensor has a small bias, for instance, here a 20 milli-g or even with a high performance laser gyro system, 25 micro-g approximately. And then you see um, this error increasing happens faster or not so fast, but it happens all the time. And if you see here over 100 seconds free inertial navigation with a MEMS system, you are in the area of a kilometer here after 100 seconds. And if you take a high performance system, yes, then it's a few centimeters. But nevertheless, if you operate one hour, it happens again. And this is a short time presentation for 10 seconds. You see the same behavior. Not only the accelerometers have an impact, also the gyros. The gyros have impact on position, but they have also an impact on the heading. Um, for the position, it is not so dramatically, depending on what kind of performance, one degree per se a second or 0 0.003 degree per hour, for instance, for high performance, but it happens and the error increases over time. So looking to the next slide, uh, we did the following. We have here an uh, underwater vehicle. It started here and then it made a two hours uh, trajectory. And uh, of course, what happens, and this was made in, in, uh, at the German Navy where we have uh, good um, uh, possibilities to survey all the things. And what happens, the trajectory was programmed uh, to have a repeatable two times um, uh, pass and at the end you have a difference and of course it is a current and um, for these torpedoes of course you do not have a DVL you have a propeller and you count the revolutions and therefore you have this problem and this shows very nice um, why to use bottom track uh, DVL in commercial and industrial applications. So here we have the 20 kilometers at the speed of three meters per second and that reckoning as a navigation um, process. So now if we want to decide how to design such an inertial and DVL based system for subsea, we have to distinguish on the one side, of course, why we need velocity aiding. Um, if we have a medium performance gyro inside, so no free inertial navigation possibility, then we have also no true north gyro compassing. So we need the magnetometer. We already heard all about the uh, uh, difficulties with magnetic uh, heading, but nevertheless, it's a possibility to do it. And so we need a mandatory velocity aiding because uh, inertial navigation um, is not really possible by integrating the acceleration. If we have a better gyro, uh, the areas in the uh, about 0 0.1 degree per hour and better. So fiber optical laser gyro, um, partially HRG gyros, then we are able to do free inertial navigation and we are able to make gyro compassing. That means to achieve the true heading from the rotation of the earth. And nevertheless, in the free inertial navigation, we have errors of a nautical mile per hour or a nautical mile per day or whatever is the performance. But 
nevertheless, the system is drifting away. And therefore also here, um, the velocity aiding improves the position and is recommended. Um, we have seen it before, we have two possibilities uh, to aid the velocity. We can take the propeller revolutions as a simple method, then we are dependent from the current, but we have one advantage. Um, it allows a secret or silent uh, operation. So nobody will hear you, um, what is always, uh, of course, an issue if you take uh, DVLs. So the other point is, um, if you want to have high performance, then the DVL is the choice um, with absolute speed with bottom track or uh, reduced performance with water track, depending again on the application. Now, this was uh, in general the information, but here we want to see by mathematical equations, how can I decide what is the right inertial navigation system to achieve a certain accuracy. Um, so from the gyroscope, mainly the gyroscope, which is measuring around the vertical axis, we have a bias, an offset, and we have noise, the random walk. And we have an initial heading error. And now uh, you can derive an equation where you can calculate what is the position error, the lateral position error, over time um, when you have a certain gyro insight. And of course, if you have a certain performance of the um, DVL or in general speaking, the odometer. So, so what happens if we start here with our heading and then this is the trajectory of our AUV, then you see the heading change or the gyro bias changes the heading. So the system is not going in this desired direction, but it changes and it gets or becomes a lateral error. And the same is for the uh, scale factor. And if we now calculate all these things, um, then you can see what is the final result for a certain requirement for inertial sensors or whatever. So everybody can take the data inside and then he can calculate for his um, application what is the needs for the inertial sensors. Um, the same is for the scale factor, the scale factor for the gyro. So if you make a motion with a turn with a 180 degree curve and you have a scale factor of, let me say 300 ppm, um, then this leads after this curve to a one mil or one milliradiant uh, heading error. And then if you travel for one kilometer, then you get one meter error. So quite simple to calculate, but you see directly the impact of the scale factor. And this is, for instance, the question for the gyro selection, um, the stability of scale factor. If you have a laser gyro, then you are here in the area of five ppm. If you have a fiber optical gyro, depending a little bit on aging of these uh, sensors, uh, it starts with a good value and ends with a worse value. Depending on technology or on the MEMS, then you are here in the area of 0.2% or even worse. Uh, the same is with the initial heading error. So your inertial measurement system should be able to provide true north um, information. And uh, of course, if you have an, a remaining error of 0 0.1 degree, for instance, then you have two meters after 1000 meter error. Therefore, also here there is a requirement for a very good heading um, from the inertial. And um, last but not least, the odometer scale factor uh, error. So if you have 0.2%, of course, after one kilometer, you have uh, two meters error. And if you take the velocity from the vehicle, then you come to some information, what is the error per time? And then of course, depending on the distance and so on, um, here for instance, uh, 30 meters per hour error. Um, important, uh, the calibration the calibration of the gyro error and of the DVL error. We will come to this uh, on one of the next slides. This is uh, on the one side, the scale factor error, but also the misalignment error that the coordinate systems of both systems are the same. Just a view to the requirements of inertial navigation for subsea applications. Uh, if we have a relative uh, localization task, then 
uh, we do not need external information, no external aiding information. So the inertial measurement system plus the DVL plus the pressure for the depth uh, is sufficient to get some relative um, positioning um, point to point or also along a path. If you want to have absolute localization, of course, you need some additional information, LBL, USBL, as we have heard in the first presentation already. We have no GPS, therefore there are no more alternatives um, from that point. And we have the calibration task, and here we have the GPS. We can dive up, we can use RTK, GNSS, and uh, then, as uh, already heard before, we can make calibration of scale factors and so on. What is very important, um, on the one side we have heard uh, we should have about uh, 10,000 times the, the, the distance of the, um, the GPS uh, accuracy. Um, and additionally, and that's very important, we have to have sufficient motion. So only diving uh, or uh, moving straight forward with constant velocity, of course, will not help because then you will not see any acceleration, any uh, angular rates. You need some, um, some change in motion, maybe also some change in velocity. And for that one, you have uh, to achieve uh, the state observability of your Kalman filter, of the sensor data fusion. Um, and this observability is something which sounds uh, theoretically, but it's very practical. You have to make motion that you can see measurement data on each sensor in a sufficient way. Now, if we look to the data fusion, um, we have here our input sensors, the GNSS, the DVL, the inertial sensors, pressure sensors, and position aiding. Then we have the extended Kalman filtering, which is also handling the latencies because all these sensors are not providing data at the same time. We have a precise clock to synchronize. And at the end, uh, we have the results. This is the position, velocity, attitude, heading, and the standard deviations. This is very important. And this you can only achieve if you have also standard deviations from these input sensors. And that's very important that these standard deviations are reliable. Here, just a view to a little bit more uh, details of the data fusion. I don't want to go into details. Uh, you find this later on in the uh, in the printout of this, um, where you have also other things which you have to consider if you want to make navigation with high performance systems, for instance, the gravity model and so on. Um, some design rules uh, for the uh, system design on the, um, on the design level, of course, we always find the same errors which are important uh, to be um, handled. You have the true north related heading, what is uh, to be provided by the IMS by gyro compassing, because you have also no dual antenna applications uh, as you know it from GPS, for instance. Um, we want to be independent from magnetic distortions. We need to estimate the DVL scale factor error um, because this is a distance traveled error. Um, this is very important. The inertial navigation system cannot give you information about the distance you have traveled, at least not over a long time. So the distance traveled is always dependent from the DVL. Of course, very short impacts can be handled by INS, but the long-term stability comes from the DVL. Therefore, this is here important. Time synchronization between both is important. And uh, not so important, but also important, the whole pitch information, of course, from the inertial measurement system. But this is always uh, very, very accurate if you have a gyro compassing device. Then on the other side, the calibration. Um, the calibration can be done with GPS at the surface or, for instance, with already surveyed uh, USBL or LBL uh, information. And uh, therefore, the calibration will improve the misalignment information between the uh, INS and the DBL. And it will also allow to calibrate the velocity 
um, error, that means the scale factor error, and the gyro scale error. Here are some requirements um, if you want to make precise uh, underwater navigation um, from the experience. So the scale factor of the velocity sensor of the DVL should be less than 0.2%. 0.1% would be nice. Uh, and what is very important that this has a certain stability after calibration. So it has not to be stable for, for very, very long time, but at least for the mission duration of the vehicle. So for a few hours. And this also um, on change of pressure, change of selen and salinity and so on. So there the modeling is very important. Then we know we need a small velocity standard deviation um, and we need a good resolution of the output of the DVL. And of course, we need a reliable uncertainty. That's the most important for the Kalman filter. If the DVL tells us that it is very uncertain, but it is very accurate, it will not help. But on the other side, if the DVL would say it is very, very accurate, and in reality, it is not accurate, it will also not help. So this must match very good uh, each to the other one. And so finally, uh, the requirements are for the data rate, not so high. It's about one hertz because all other things is done by the inertial measurement system. Uh, trigger input rate, yes, five hertz is nice. Um, the trigger output is also sufficient with that one. And then we come to two important things, the trigger latency. The latency itself is not very important as long as it is constant. If we know this, then we can model it. Um, so the latency can be up to 150, 200 milliseconds or whatever, but the data jitter, the performance of the sampling, the time between trigger and data acquisition, the stability, this must be very accurate, better than two milliseconds or one millisecond. Otherwise you have this error inside of your signal processing, especially if you use uh, faster vessels. If you have very low uh, velocity, it doesn't matter so much. And of course, to have an output of the raw data uh, to perform also a tightly coupled solution between inertial and DVL. Um, now we are nearly at the end of the presentation. So um, if you select a DVL you or if you select an inertial measurement system, you have to be very careful with the data sheet available uh, in the market. For instance, for the inertial measurement system, manufacturers do not clearly distinguish between gyro bias day-to-day -day stability and gyro bias instability from L invariance. This sounds very um, more or less the same for somebody who is not uh, deeply involved in this uh, signal processing, but um, finally it is totally different. And most manufacturers only tell you gyro bias. And um, the difference of both is the day-to-day -day stability, of course, is switch on, switch off. Over all the temperatures, you have a certain performance. But the gyro bias instability is something which is acquired at absolutely constant temperature and which is only valid for a few seconds or maximum an hour. And therefore, this value is typically much, much better than the other one, but it will not really help you if you have a changing environment. So, for instance, for an MEMS gyro, as an example, some values, the day to day stability. Um, is, for instance, 0 0.1 or 0 0.2 degree per second, sometimes also a little bit better. But the bias instability is 0 0.002 degree per second. That means about five degree per hour. So this value sounds very nice, but at the end you have to be very careful what is the content and what are you doing with that one. This is, for instance, important for the filter integration um, for, for long-term stability and so on. Um, with the DVL, it is the same. If you look uh, uh, to DVL um, um, components, uh, then you find uh, some very interesting um, advertising where you find, for instance, the smallest DVL in the market, and then there are comparisons between all the manufacturers, but the most important value, and this means the, the, um, the scale factor, is not inside of the table. Therefore, um, it looks all very nice, the smallest is the nicest, but if you look a little bit deeper, then you find out that the uh, scale factor error 
is uh, 10 times more than, uh, for instance, what the Nordic has. And therefore, you have also to look very carefully about the data and about the combination capabilities. So it is very important to make an overall error estimation before you do any integration for your application. And uh, here also an example for, for such a data shield. So both values are given a class five degree per hour for bias instability, L invariance, and 0 0.2 degree per second, two milliG for bias day to day. This, by the way, is a very, very small device uh, for, for, for diving uh, systems, for instance, only 50 grams. And um, so you find all the classes of performance from very small to high end. Yes, and then I'm at the end of my presentation. Thank you very much. And um, if you have questions, then please ask them later on. Thanks. Yes, <clears throat> thank you, Edgar, for sharing your insights and recommendations. Uh, now we will have our final presentation. And after that, we will run a quick uh, Q&A session. So without further ado, let me introduce our last speaker, David Oven. Uh, David is uh, a ROV technical manager at Citronics, And his presentation is called uh, Valor reaching beyond its class. Okay, <laughs> right. Thanks, guys. Um, thanks for the uh, opportunity to present today. Um, so I will just quickly cover um, who Citronics is um, for anyone that doesn't know, um, anyone with a sort of traditional kind of survey rental background. Um, a background to how we came, um, how we came about to to create Valor from um, our previous product line. Um, some of the key drivers and the features and design choices we made uh, and some of the key sort of technology differences that um, exist in Valor compared to the uh, existing marketplace um, and sort of key differentiators. Um, so um, for anyone who doesn't know, Citronics um, is predominantly a marine electronics rental company. Um, we've been around for about 40 years. Um, most ROV industry people, um, particularly the oil and gas related guys in the survey um, people, they, they know Seatronics from our extensive range of uh, survey equipment. Um, we've been part of the Actian group since um, 2007. So um, Actian's our parent company and also has um, some uh, survey companies like uh, UTEC um, in, in the same group, which gives us a good, really good insight into what survey operators are required in from a vehicle. Um, Actian's kind of key focus recently, um, particularly since the downturn, has been on uh, field services. So trying to provide the industry with a, a whole kind of market solution, not just a uh, sort of one division does one part. Um, we, we are quite connected as a group. Um, so Valor um, was actually not Citronics's um, first RV experience. They, they used to own the... Uh, they used to operate the Predator ROV and then they purchased the um, intellectual property back in 2010 from Global Marine. Um, it, you know, it wasn't necessarily their, their idea to, to make an ROV. Um, it was really just to provide um, a solution to customers who came along to, to rent equipment and then and needed a, a vehicle to carry that, to, that uh, equipment on. Um, Predator was pretty successful. Um, Unfortunately, um, it was it was quite a mature product by the time Citronics came to acquire it, and then on um, sort of obviously late 2014, 2015, the oil and mass uh, oil and gas market crashed. Um, so there was a lot of project cancellations and capex uh, reduction, um, and really the sort of predator didn't quite deliver what the, the sort of market requirements were. Um, so there was a real pressure to kind of recoup some of the costs and provide, um, a, you know, provide a solution to the market that uh, fulfilled what, what the people were requiring. Um, also, a sort of secondary driver to that uh, was that we had some um, big discussions in sort of late 2015, 2016 into the uh, law enforcement um, homeland security type market particularly around sort of ID threats and, uh, um, you know, protection of, uh, of divers, etc., cetera, in, in that sort of harbour homeland security area. So it pretty, pretty much became clear that the Predator was um, 
was not really providing the solution required and that um, a lot of technology had moved on, sensor um, sensors had moved on, they needed more bandwidth, et cetera, and, and more integration was required. Um, so that kind of led on to the development of Valor. Um, so the concept of Valor, uh, Valor is actually an acronym, so it stands for Versatile and Lightweight um, Observation ROV. Um, was you know really to fit in to cover um, a large number of, of bases. It was not to focus purely on oil and gas. It was not a survey vehicle. Um, it was not a really small homeland security vehicle. So um, in order to get kind of group justification for development of the vehicle, we had to really cover um, several markets that um, that would provide a return on investment, obviously. Um, and that really required a bit of a game changing solution. In the development of Valor. Um, so we really wanted to create um, a small vehicle that um, would have more connectivity, was more capable and was a more cost effective price point than sort of anything else that was existing in the market. Um, so yeah that's that's where we came up with um, and you know the, we probably hit most of those, probably the weights a little bit out compared to where we want to be, but um, we've got to compromise somewhere. So um, I'll just go through where where some of the design choices were on, on Valor. So um, obviously technology has grown exponentially um, in recent years you know, with the explosion of mobile devices, um, connectivity over, over network 4G, um, offshore satcoms, et cetera. Um, the automotive market's obviously driven Huge advances in in motor technology, um, connectivity, video compression um, in the broadcast industry, etc. So, we really wanted to tap into some of that, um, and all of these um, all these sort of sensor developments that we've seen as well um, <clears throat> really had um, not been a, a adopted pretty pretty quickly, pretty heavily by sort of some some of the subsea market. Tends to be a bit of a slower um, adoption rate. Um, particularly in sensor fusion and sort of data-driven decisions, which we really wanted to capture into um, and apply to the vehicle. So um, when we looked at the at the ROV from kind of the bottom up, we realized it was all about bandwidth. Um, sensors are just, you know, exploding in bandwidth and, and their connectivity requirements. Um, if you look at some of the, the existing work class ROVs, you know, they okay we're all we're all fiber based nowadays but they're traditional mux cards or maybe three to four gigs maybe six gig gigabytes of data bandwidth um but you know most a lot of sensors now are touching on one one gigabit ethernet connectivity easily um and then when you start doing sensor fusion which requires um bi-directional data and timing solutions there just really isn't um enough bandwidth um, even on even on some of the large work class solutions and if you look at the OBS the small OBS vehicles um, you know a good number of them are still pretty heavily copper based um, or just using you know, plug-in uh, add-on cards which um, gives you a small increase in data capability but it does really sort of limit um, usefulness and uh, and sort of uh, limit their um, applicability um, so yeah the so um, our decision was obviously to go on to um, an Ether-based, uh, Ethernet-based system. So we went um, and looked at all the existing market solutions um, and came up with um, a, a sort of off-the-shelf um, 40 gigabit Ethernet optical switch um, from the telecoms, telecoms sort of industrial computing and um, markets rather than traditional um, sort of subsea ROV type uh, solutions, um, which really gave us the, the kind of backbone of the system um, and allowed us to develop um, around that uh, a full Ethernet based um, control system and um, connectivity model. Um, so to the switch model, uh, mod module sorry we add our own interface um, power and connection cards which does um, CDO to Ethernet conversion um, and power monitoring and, and power configuration. Um, 
the benefits are, are pretty substantial on this. Um, you know, we we can have um, full network connectivity of any sensor to to any other sensor in the network. Once it's in the network, it's the data is um, sort of universal to to the system. Um, we configured the vehicle. We didn't want um, you know one of the pain points of ROVs is always getting uh, sensors plugged into the system. You know, particularly um, on our our Valor offering, um, because we are. A rental company, and we have a lot, a lot of rental customers. We do, we do sell Valor as well. But um, taking one of the sort of points from our our um, rental um, users was that it's obviously a lot of hassle in getting sensors plugged in, getting cables made, not knowing what the pinouts, etc. Are so Valor is configured around just five standard user ports. We can expand that a little bit, but the standard system is five user ports um, that offers um, standard pinout, standard connection, one connector type, one connector size, um, and it's all configurable through, through software for um, the voltage levels, power um, monitoring and, and current limit. Um, each channel has a full one gigabit ethernet and uh, selectable serial channels on selectable baud rate, et cetera, through the software and uh, one PPS timing for um, data synchronization across all the sensors. We also have a couple of um, camera ports on the system. Um, again, we've made a decision to go with uh, machine vision cameras. So we've actually gone for ethernet based cameras, um, full um, gigi vision. So it's it's pretty, well, it's, you know, around about 2K machine vision cameras. Um, that's been, that's been a little bit difficult and um, just because it was a new technology um but we do we, we can also um accept uh, standard hd sort of hd sdi cameras on the system as well now um but the benefit of obviously ip cameras is <clears throat> again once the video is on the network we can distribute that um anywhere around the network and um, distribute it to recording equipment or uh, remote viewing etc um, overall, there's about two kilowatts of user power via those five ports, um, and uh, we also incorporate, as standard, um, a MEMS-based um, INS module. Um, it's not not as standard; it's not survey grade um, INS, but it's it's um, accuracy is enough, particularly when it's aided with um, a DVL um, to do uh, waypoint following, and um, obviously with the DVL do station um, position hold etc station keep um which really is is a bit of a and you know the the dvl um can fit straight into the vehicle package with um, with the ins module and plugs direct can plug directly into the ins so the coupling is is um pretty direct which allows for uh, improved accuracy um so therefore we we kind of believe that valor has solved the initial bandwidth problem um, but that's kind of only one aspect of a small ROV. So power is, is usually the next problem. Um, and if you look at a lot of um, small OBS ROVs, they're quite limited in their uh, their power and operational C state. Um, so we really focused on getting the maximum power to the vehicle um, and really sort of running the vehicle um, at the highest voltage level to get us the, the best thrust um, figure. So um, looking across the board, we're you know pretty high combined bollard pool um, or, or uh, current operating state. Um, and that's pretty much the sort of class leading um, in, in the size of the Valor against the, OBS, the sort of standard OBS vehicles. Um, we do have the option to provide a second power channel to the vehicle, um, which would give you another 10 kilowatts of power to allow you to plug on uh, tooling, um, tooling skids, tooling packages, if you want to do sort of more powerful um, cleaning options um, on the system. Um, so that, that is an, an option, but um, as I say, it has to be added on. Um, so how did, how did we back up all of this, all these claims? Um, we've done quite a lot of heavy um, analysis and um, development. We've done a lot of CFD to improve the uh, the 
flow through the frame, the first couple of um, models and concepts in the Valor framework. Um, I fully admit we're a bit of a disaster. Um, and then laterally, we actually went to um, the flow wave facility down at Edinburgh University and operated the vehicle in a full three, three knots of current um, and sat with a Nortec uh, DVL 1000 on, on the vehicle and held position in the three knot current. So we, um, you know, we have the kind of data and the, and the, the engineering to back up the claims, um, which we're pretty pleased about. Uh, so obviously all this power and all this connectivity isn't really much use if you don't have a, a good control system. Um, a lot of problems with um, small vehicles is that if they're not underpowered, then they're overpowered and they become a bit twitchy and not very um, handleable from the user point of view. Um, so we worked um, alongside an industrial partner to come up with the software that controls the vehicle for, um, and we call it internally call it um, Syntonic Control. So basically it's a, a 3D model of the vehicle um, in the pilot interface and um, the error is calculated from the vehicle's exact position via INS um, aided solution um, to the 3D model. And that's the error that's used to calculate the, uh, the positional moves and the, or the control demand, um, which is really beneficial um, from a pilot point of view. They don't have to learn um, how the vehicle handles particularly um, closely, the, the vehicle more or less flies itself. Um, and uh, it, it makes the vehicle really easy to handle. And a lot of the feedback we've had from pilots is they really, they really do like the, the, the handling on the vehicle and it's very, very controllable. Um, the, the further benefit of this, it makes autonomous control um, really, really straightforward, very easy. Um, as I say, Ethernet connectivity means that we can take external remote inputs from um, either third party um, 3D um, positioning applications or even external, uh, take the, the pilot's console and just um, ex extend that over the network um, for uh, to a remote distance, remote location. Um, the vehicle um, doesn't, doesn't, really, doesn't really care where the pilot is from that point of view, as long as the network sees each other. Um, and the connectivity is up to a suitable level, then um, we're pretty good. Um, we're actually just doing a system just now where we'll have um, a full um, remote control for a EOD application. So yeah, that's where we're at with the control side of things. So yeah, the vehicle is just a kind of key point. Um, versatile, pretty much limitless in sensors that we can plug into it with the uh, Ethernet connectivity and the power um, and also the additional tooling power that we have. We have a range of skids for the vehicle to um, add on extra functionality, MINIPS and cleaning um, and then heavy cavitation type cleaning with the, the extra power. Um, I'm just going to touch on some of the user autonomy functions because um, software is obviously particularly where the, the vehicle um, is really a bit of um, really quite different to existing uh, small sized um, ROV um, observation class ROVs, which is where we feel that it's reaching beyond its class. Um, so um, the, the, ROV, the control system software um, via the INS on the vehicle and the soft, uh, software inputs on the surface um, can all be geo-referenced. So the the INS module that we use as standard um, will take a direct GPS input, so you can surface the vehicle um, and take um, updates via um, GNSS, and that will update and uh, correct some of the INS errors along with um, DVL. We can also take a USBL input direct via the Surface Console um, and provide that to the vehicle, to the INS on the vehicle, to uh, improve um, positioning accuracy, et cetera, as well. Um, but it's really quite simple. Um, there's no chart shown in this view, but um, the, uh, the, the background screen there can all be geo-referenced with a, with a chart or a map or um, actually CD um, CAD models can be, or 2D CAD models can be referenced on the back there as well. Um, so that really, um, allows you to, that's, that's the main pilot 
screen um, and from there we can do um, the mission view so you can create a mission which um, that screen shown there is just a 2D display of vehicle you can add ship's position you can add um, as I say the charts, charts and the maps and you can then just create waypoints on on that screen and uh, just by simple right click drop a waypoint and then the waypoints are all editable to be um, to include X, Y, Z uh, position. Um, once you've created those waypoints, it's pretty much uh, just click on the system, um, execute mission, and the vehicle would follow those waypoints, navigate around those waypoints, and can reverse mission, etc., back to the home point as well. Obviously, accuracy the accuracy is highly dependent on your uh, sensors that you've got fitted at the time, but um, pretty much we can do this with just the standard MEMS INS um, to within about three meters um, with the standard uh, INS and a DVL. Like I'd say it gives us about three meter of accuracy in our, our trial so far over um, you know, sort of standard velocity, standard currents. Um, another benefit is these is we can save all these missions um, just by um, tagging them, saving them onto the, onto the ROV system. Um, and then we can load them back up at any time, um, particularly if you've got the chart saved on the back of uh, reference on the back of there as well. You can uh, come back at a later date and do uh, the exact same mission, same position reference, which allows you obviously to do uh, side by side comparisons if you're looking at um, asset management, um, you know, um, SCAR profiles, etc. Um, particularly the renewable guys really like this because they can come back and check uh, the renewable assets really well. Um, yeah, just going through the missions. Sorry. Um, if you don't, um, if you're not have a sort of pre-planned mission, or if you don't know your current position, you can also just you can also drop um, a region. So you just drag, drag and drop a square box on the system, and then add pattern profiles. So you can do um, what is called most standard um, XY um, survey sweep or sawtooth profile. Um, just honest, it's, it's really simple to do. Right click, add the profile, and then execute the mission and the vehicle. Um, we'll just follow that whole, um, whole regional profile. Um, again, you can go into each waypoint. You can get the vehicle to change depth um, at any time during that profile as well. If, the, if you're following a, a seabed pattern that the, the seabed drops down below you. Um, yeah, and they can be uh, saved, they can be repeated. Um, you can add in exclusion areas, you can uh, block out um, certain waypoints if you need to when you come back later. There's maybe been another asset dropped in, in position, so you can um, just disable a couple of waypoints to, to sweep around that. Um, and yeah, it's really, it's really pretty powerful and really, um, really quick and efficient to set up and uh, repeatability, which has been one of the main features that we've aimed for, um, particularly for the survey guys and uh, asset management guys. So yeah, that's pretty much um, all the sort of main points um, I wanted to cover. Um, I mean, we pretty much firmly believe that within the market segment segment we were in, um, small vehicles hadn't really developed that quickly. Um, so we really wanted to turn it on its head and get, you know, the ROV could really be, Valor could really be classed as a, as a bit of a flying mux rather than a, a direct um, ROV um, um, product um, initially. Certainly that was what we were calling it internally as we developed it. So it really is one of the, um, one of the most um, highest payload vehicles in its class. It's got more system power than uh, any of the other um, sort of comparable size vehicles and more thrust. Um, and there's very little power compromised um, to provide that thrust. You know, it's a full, um, the, the thruster power is, is separate from the, the user power. So you're not swapping uh, one for the other. Uh, industry leading uh, autonomous uh, control software and automation through that control software. Um, Midwater station keeping, um, position hold with obviously DVL aiding if we if you fit DVL, um, remote 
um, or standoff control um, is enabled um, pretty much um, with very little change to the system. Um, and full one gigabit Ethernet um, connectivity. So we pretty much feel that Valor is um, well positioned and enabled for all the latest uh, sensors that are being uh, brought to market recently. Um, and we also have the ability to add some pretty complex uh, tooling packages um, on the vehicle um, via the, um, auxiliary, uh, the, the auxiliary power options that we have available. Um, yeah, the, and you know, pretty really straightforward software really makes it easy to pick up the vehicle, get to know the system um, pretty quickly, and uh, allows the operator to really concentrate on the task at hand without kind of fighting the vehicle and trying to be uh, overly concerned about how to how to fly the vehicle because it really does uh, fly pretty easily, pretty much. Uh, um, doesn't quite fly itself, but it's getting close. <laughs> um, so yeah, I think that's that's us. Um, that's that's most of my presentation. Happy to take some questions on uh, on uh, the Valor and anyone else. Yes, uh, thank you, David, for sharing about your advanced technology. Um, now, if uh, anyone has any questions, uh, please use the option to raise your hand if you want to ask your question aloud, or you can type your question in the chat box. Okay, so um, it seems like everything was really clear. And if anyone has any questions, you can always get in touch uh, with Nortec and we will share um, the details of our today's guest speakers. Um, thank you, everyone. Um, thank you for your time and I hope you have a great day. Yes, thank you very much. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, everybody. Bye-bye.